Charles, let me introduce my Westminster panel now. Here with me throughout the programme, Robert Jenrick, the Conservative MP for Newark. He lost his job as Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government last year. In fact, the whole department disappeared. It's now focused on levelling up. Seaman Malhotra represents Feltham and Heston for Labour and she is the Shadow Minister for Business and Consumers. Kezia Dugdale was Labour's leader in Scotland but she's left politics now for Glasgow University where she's the director of the John Smith Centre for Public Service. And here to guide us through what's bound to be another eventful week at Westminster is The Spectator's Deputy Political Editor, Katie Balls. So welcome to all of you and welcome to Seema and Kezia who join us down the line and we'll be hearing from you both shortly. Um, Let's focus on what's been happening in Downing Street. Five big departures from there on Thursday had Westminster all a quiver. Most shocking, perhaps a stinging rebuke from Mandira Mirza, the the woman dubbed Boris Johnson's brain. She'd been at his side for years, but quit her job as director of the Number 10 Policy Unit, citing his failure to apologise over his Keir Starmer remarks. Now, some new names have come into Downing Street. Um... But will it be enough to calm restive Conservative backbenchers? What do you reckon, Robert Jenrick? How how would you sum up your party mood this evening? Well, good evening. Thank you for having me on the programme again. Look, I've just spent three days in my constituency in Nottinghamshire. And it is undoubtedly true that public concern is very deep. The damage to the party's reputation is serious and will take a considerable effort to change that. There is, however, having spoken to many, many of my constituents over the last few days, there is appreciation of the numerous successes of the Prime Minister, breaking the deadlock in Parliament back in 2019, securing Brexit, saving the country from Jeremy Corbyn, the vaccine programme, ensuring that we're one of the most open economies in the world. And there's also very little public appetite for the Conservative Party at this moment in time, when we're facing a cost of living crisis and insecurity abroad, to descend into a leadership contest and all of the damage that that does. So my sense is that although there is serious concern and a huge challenge ahead to restore trust and confidence, at the moment, many, perhaps most Conservative MPs want the Prime Minister to succeed, want Number Mm. 10 and these changes to work, and want us to concentrate on those important issues, which ultimately will decide the success or failure of the Conservative Party All right. and the country in the year ahead. I'll let you make your list once, because if if we keep talking about, uh, you know, the the list that Conservative MPs say about, uh, well, you I, know, the I, vaccine rollout and all that. Well, I, don't say don't... that I don't say that lightly, <laughs> Carolyn, because I think no, no. you have to view this issue you, in the round. You've said of it now. Of course there are concerns about the leadership of the Prime Minister and the way that Number 10 has yeah. been managed. But the choice for Conservative MPs is to weigh that against the successes and make a sensible balanced judgment. And I think at the moment, people want the Prime Minister and his operation to improve and ultimately to succeed. They don't want to take the risk of a leadership contest, which I think is the last thing the country needs at this it's, moment in time. It's difficult, though, because, I mean, you say most MPs, but, I mean, I certainly have spoken to a lot of MPs who feel desperately unhappy. Uh, one former cabinet minister who said that they're under great pressure from their association to put that letter in, calling for a, a, a vote of, of no confidence, and, and they're sort of crying out for some reason not to do that. Um, one 2019er MP told me that four of them are thinking of following the former minister, Nick Gibbon, putting in a letter. You know, it's it's difficult, really, for you to say all MPs because there's an awful well, lot going well, I, on I, under the... Well, I didn't say all most. MPs, yeah. and I, I have a great deal of sympathy for many of those colleagues who have come out and said that they feel that change is necessary. Mm. I think my point is that these are serious times. We are facing some very significant challenges as a country. And the choice to change leader at this moment in time is a significant one. And I don't think that most of my colleagues feel that that test has yet been met. They may wish to wait and see the Sue Gray report, the outcome of the police, and that's perfectly justifiable. 
But I think it's un it's not correct to say that most now wish the Conservative Party to lose sight of those bigger issues and tip itself into a, a, a leadership contest, which could Kate, be very damaging to all concerned. Katie Balls, I mean, what, what's your assessment? Um, I mean, are you hearing more MPs talking about submitting letters or, or do you think it seems to sort of go in peaks and troughs at the moment, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think from covering this story uh, from where I think it really picked up again in the new year, whenever you get to a day where things look really bad for Boris Johnson, it tends to go better for the Prime Minister than you think. And then when things seem as though they're turning a corner, the opposite happens. And I think that's what happened last week to a degree. There was a sense that last week would be the week that he turned the corner. Instead, it seemed to be one of the most difficult weeks yet for the Prime Minister and that Boris Johnson in a very perilous position. We're now in a sense where I think we've seen over the weekend Boris Johnson tried to suggest that he is getting a grip on his operation again. We've had new appointments um, in the form of Steve Barkley as Chief of Staff, Guti Harry as the new Director of Communications. And I think that while there's some scepticism, I think, about how those are going to work, I think it had it has succeeded in the sense there hasn't been an immediate backlash, which there was the potential to be, depending who you put in those positions. Um, but there's still a lot of unease. I think that it is very hard to predict because you have a situation where um, you're looking at the week coming up, you know, will we hit 54 letters? I think there would be some surprise amongst Boris Johnson's supporters if you did. But at the same time, because there is not one person organising this, um, because the letters are coming in from various parts of the party, different groups have different reasons, I can see a situation where you almost accidentally get to 54 letters on a day where no one really expects it. It's not tied to a significant event. And all of a sudden we're talking about a confidence vote. Are you um, expecting or, or, or should we expect more announcements this week about personnel changes, a new permanent secretary perhaps, or or even a, a reshuffle of the, the cabinet? Yeah, well, we know um, that's one of the key positions that Boris Johnson now needs to fill as a permanent secretary. And I think that we're also expecting a few new appointments in terms of how Number 10 operates in, in the coming days as well. Um, there's been lots of talk, for example, about someone like David Kenzini, a Linton Crosby ally coming in. And I think MPs expect there to be uh, more to, more to follow from just the announcements at the weekend. They see that as uh, you know a sign of things to come around the end. And then I think there is uh, talk of a potential a mini reshuffle. Um, I think you have to see whether the prime minister will really go ahead with it because it comes with risks of its own. Um, there's been deep unhappiness in recent weeks over the whips office. Um, there's been some briefing even it seems from number ten against the whips office, which isn't really the done thing given they often execute your will, and therefore. I think that lots of the MPs who have decided to support Boris Johnson have been in meetings where they have been led to believe um, they could be about to be promoted, <laughs> um, perhaps as, you know, a junior whip, something like that. I think particularly the 2019 intake. So there's definitely mm. an expectation amongst MPs that something like this is going to happen. I think the issue for Boris Johnson is clearly it's quite a dangerous game. Uh, you know, well, that is moving your chief whip. That'd be Mark Spencer if that were to happen. But even I think just tinkering around the edges... Um, you start to disappoint people. And if you don't go far enough, you'll perhaps upset some of the people who've decided to support you for the time being. Kezia Dugdale, um, you're at the John Smith Centre now and you're doing a lot of work on trust in politics and democracy. Uh, you, you heard what Robert was saying about, you know, the, the, the fear that this, this has done damage and, uh, you know, reputational credibility damage as well. Is it the fact that all politicians get tarred with the same brush when something like Partygate happens, do you think? I think there is very clear evidence for that. So the John Smith Centre were interested in the evidence and the research and what that tells us about what's likely to happen. And the reality is that trust in politicians has been low in the United Kingdom for a long time now, since record began, actually. It got substantially worse after the last economic crash in 2008, and it worsened still after Brexit. The reason that's important is because when levels of trust are low, the public expect rules to be broken. So actually, they're not that surprised when that happens. It's almost priced into the dynamic. And you can see evidence for that again in the work that the think tank More in Common have done just before Christmas, which actually shows us that 83, 83% of the population in the United Kingdom think all MPs are corrupt. And actually, since Partygate, that feeling has intensified by 52%. So 52% of those people think MPs are even more corrupt than they were before. So this is damaging not just the Prime Minister, 
but every politician and political institutions in the round. It's far too simple just to look at the Prime Minister's approval ratings, which are going down and are at the second lowest level of any serving Prime Minister, or indeed to look at the Labour Party's fortunes, which are rising with two months of consistent poll leads. This issue is cutting through with the public. We know that they're aware of the story. And we also know that faith and trust in politicians and governments is now the second biggest issue of concern to voters across the United Kingdom. Mm. That was evident in a recent Ipsos Mori issues poll. Uh, Suma Malhotra, I'm sure you are keeping an eye on the the Prime Minister's approval rating and Labour's ratings as well. But given what Kezia was saying and what we've been discussing, I mean, what do you think Sir Keir Starmer's strategy should be now? I mean, should you continue to focus on party gate and, uh, you know, have the risk that people will say, stop talking about this, there are other serious issues? Or should he now be drilling down into policy? What do you think the strategy should be? I think the first thing to say is I, uh, the Prime Minister's position is, in my view, untenable. And I I think he should resign. I I think this is a a matter that makes me um, extremely disappointed as a as a politician, and uh, when we're looking at all the other important issues that need to be discussed and debated, uh, when we know that the government has been behind the curve on tackling the cost of living crisis, spiring energy bills, Um, we know that the the Tories still plan to bring in the tax hikes uh, in April, even though we're facing this really deep cost of living crisis that's going to continue. And not just that, but there's been this huge sadness of families who have felt utterly betrayed when they have had loved ones that they have lost, that have not been able to mourn properly um, as a result of the, the lockdown constraints in COVID. The, the, the Prime Minister is affecting trust in politics, and he's clearly also running a, a sinking ship. We are now past the point of this just being about disgruntled Tory MPs who think the Prime Minister looks like a liability. You've now had an advisor who's been by his side for 14 years who doesn't think he has any moral authority left. And so the arguments that were being made in defence of Boris Johnson just really aren't holding even in his own inner circle. Mm. And I would say as well, just this point that it's incredulous to me that the Prime Minister expects Steve Barclay, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, to have a third job running his office. And if he thinks that means that everything is now going to run smoothly, I I just think he's taking us all for fools. You know, we we now need a prime minister that is going to be running the country properly. We've got one that doesn't tell the truth. And Britain can't go on like this. It's a barely functioning government. And and he has to go. Seema, just in 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 one sentence, though, and very briefly, should you be going on about Partygate now or drilling down into policy? What do you think? I think we are drilling down into policy. I think if you've seen the debates that we've been having on the detail of whether there should be a VAT cut, which we still believe for for energy bills, or whether, you know, the debate that we've got coming up this week on um, children's mental health um, support, there's there's a huge amount of policy being drilled down in Parliament every day by Labour. And I think the problem is that the, the way that the Prime Minister is digging in and trying to hold on desperately to his own position of power. I think he's stopped thinking about the country in all honesty. That's Um, where the problem is lying.